Good afternoon, hello. I'm Lynn Maddox. On behalf of the Metro Nashville Historical Commission and as chair of the commission, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the 47th Annual Preservation Awards Program. The commission and I look forward to this time each year to celebrate Nashville's accomplishments and milestones in preservation. I believe historic preservation is a conversation with our past about our future. It provides us with opportunities to ask what is important in our history? What parts of our past can we preserve for the future? How does what we learn shape our city? Through the lens of historic preservation, we look at history in different ways, ask different questions of our past, learn new things about our history and ourselves. Historic preservation is an important way for us to share our understanding of the past with future generations. By our actions now, we can keep our history available to those generations so that they may ask their own questions. Nashville's history includes many aspects and historic preservation helps us tell those stories. Hearing these stories, good and bad, happy and sad, help us define Nashville so we can learn from their lessons and move forward. Our past is central to our strength and identity as a city a city that is forever changing, yet distinctive and unique to the extent in which we preserve it. Some historic preservation involves celebrating events and people and places and ideas that we are proud of. Other times it involves recognizing moments in our history which are painful or uncomfortable or are difficult to remember. Within Metro Nashville, many people work hard and strive to preserve our history archaeologists, architects, curators, historians, landscape architects, cultural resource professionals, public servants, elected officials, and concerned citizens, just to name a few. It is our privilege to honor them today during May, Historic Preservation Month. I want to begin by thanking the commissioners of the Metro Historical Commission who work to document history save and reuse buildings, make the public more aware of the necessity and advantages of preservation in Nashville and Davidson County, and to the commissioners serving on the Metro Historic Zoning Commission, who review applications to create new historic overlay districts and review and approve preservation permits in historic and conservation, conservation districts. Both of these commissions put in a lot of time and effort into keeping the fabric of Nashville's communities in place. Please join me in thanking them and recognizing them for all they do. It is now my honor to introduce Tim Walker, the Executive Director of the Metro Historical Commission and the Metro Historic Zoning Commission. Thank you, Lynn, and good afternoon. Uh, as Lynn said, my name is Tim Walker, and I'm the Executive Director of the Metro Historical Commission. And once again, thank you for joining us for the 47th Annual Preservation Awards Program. Uh, it's great to be back in person after three years, so glad you guys are here. It's good to see a full audience, too. Uh, before we begin the presentation today, I just want to take a moment and thank those who made today's event possible. And so I'm going to double back on Lynn and recognize our commissioners one more time and push that. Uh, but I want to recognize both our historical commissioners and historic zoning commissioners. Uh, we have in total 15 commissioners on one board and we have nine on the other. And many of them are here today. So if I could get you to stand, please, commissioners, so you can be recognized and people can see you. Our two commissions, they volunteer their time and energy and provide guidance and support to me and my staff. And we're really so appreciative for their service. So thank you. Also want to thank Historic Nashville and the Preservation Society of Nashville, our local nonprofits for historic preservation, as well as the MHC Foundation or the Metro Historical Commission Foundation. They're the friends group for our office. All three organizations are co-sponsoring the reception that will follow the awards presentation. 
So I hope you'll join us for that. I want to thank Hastings Architecture for hosting this afternoon's reception at their office in the former Ben West Library Building, which is also a historic landmark. And I want to thank the Nashville Public Library for allowing us to use this auditorium, as well as Metro ITS for being here today to record this event for later airing on Metro YouTube and Metro Channel 3. And finally, uh, I could not stop without thanking my staff. Uh, many of them are here, or most of them are here today, and they're probably in the back, but I'm going to have them stand up. Every one of my staff has helped in some way over the last few weeks. Staff, where are you? There they are. Stand. <laughs> They've helped in some way to put this presentation on today, and I want to especially thank Scarlett Miles, who's in the very back at the door. Scarlett led the effort. She chaired the program this year, and she's done a fantastic job. So thank you, Scarlett. Well, I now have the great honor, it really is, to introduce our keynote speaker and our mayor, John Cooper. Our mayor has uh, reigned over a very difficult four years, and I think you'd all agree with that. He's had to overcome a city budget crisis when he took the helm in 2019. And in 2020, he let, had to lead the city through several disasters. A tornado in March, a Dureco in May, and a Christmas Day bombing. In the midst of all these tragedies, beginning in March, there was a worldwide pandemic that changed the way we worked and lived and played. And uh, our mayor, I'm so thankful we had him to get us through those four years because he's done an excellent job. I'll have to say in my time as director of the Metro Historical Commission, which is just shy of 15 years, that we've never had a mayor who's cared so much about our city, its heritage, and supported historic preservation like he has. And I don't want to embarrass you because I'm just going to list just a few of the things that he's accomplished in four years. He's funded a master plan and stonewall repairs at Fort Nagley. He provided additional funds to maintain better the Nashville City Cemetery. He's funded repairs to Sunnyside and its outbuildings in Sevier Park. He's funded additional staff for the department, including a city archaeologist position. He supported the Historic Property Tax Abatement Program, our city's first true historic preservation incentive. He purchased and saved the African American School for the Blind at 88 Hermitage from demolition. He has funded the rehab of Fisk University's Burris Hall for a small business incubator, and he supported a HUD grant to fund repairs at the historic campus buildings at American Baptist College. And again, that's just a few of the things he's done in a very short four years. So with that said, he is, he's truly a mayor who cares about our city, its history, and its historic character. So I hope you will join me in welcoming him to the podium and thanking him. Mayor Cooper. Thank you, Dan. Well, I've, um, I've never been so, uh, golly, well now, thank you. You, you all are very dear. I'm over. I'm overwhelmed, and thank you. And I'm I'm here to thank you, particularly all these commissioners. These are long meetings, and very difficult, and hard to do. Um, but a thought for you, all of you commissioners that do the hard work of preservation uh, on a monthly basis, is. Historic preservation is the thing that we always wish we had more, you know, that we had saved more, done more. When you look back, that's our only regret, is we wish we had done more. And as you make the hard choices in the future, just, just remember that the future generations are going to be like us, going, I wish we had saved more. I wish we'd preserved more of the authenticity of our city. Now, our city is changing. I'm actually going to go tomorrow, I'm, uh, it's a long flight, to Erbil, Kurdistan. Why would the mayor of Nashville go to Erbil, Kurdistan? Well, they want to be our sister city. 
and we have the largest Kurdish population outside of Kurdistan in the whole world, 25,000 Kurds. It's very important to our new, evolving, changing city to recognize that unique cultural heritage and to show up and say, we're excited to have our Kurdish community here in Nashville, and they're helping to make us to be a better Nashville just as our commissioners are here too. Now, a couple of exciting things. This is the 47th annual Preservation Awards, and that's great. That's great that our awards have our own history, and thank you, Tim and Lynn. Um, and I want to recognize somebody who I think has been very important to Nashville, and with the Second Avenue recovery, we're all going to be excited to see the largest Phil Ponder painting in the world. <laughs> It's going to be on our Second Avenue. It itself is going to be a major tourist attraction and event. And thank you that we can celebrate a living artist that's both helping preserve and um, recreate our past. After the bombing, you know, it's a, it's a great thing to do that. But to be, uh, today's award recipients are saving the places that make Nashville special and creating a physical link between the past and the past present. And Tim mentioned some of these things that have been so important to us. Imagine a Nashville that didn't say Fort Knightley. Wow, and you know that almost happened. I see Gary right here in the front row. He'd agree with me. That seemed like it was almost going to happen. But today, and I think there are going to be a lot of exciting announcements about this in the weeks ahead, um, I think it's getting in good shape. You know, the stonemasons can only work as quickly as stonemasons can, but within a few years, we're going to do by that site something that's just going to make us famous nationally and internationally. That, imagine having a UNESCO World Heritage Site in your own downtown and not making use of it. Well, it's going to be a flagship for us. Now, we had challenges. Thank you, Tim, for mentioning them. A little bit of PTSD. I guess. Um, um, you know, in the tornado, you realize how vulnerable we are to just things like weather events that cost us a lot of our history. Our historic courthouse was caught on fire due to human misdeed. The Christmas bombing on our 2nd Avenue, originally the, the heart of our city, it's really how Nashville happened was 2nd Avenue, unloading goods by the river. And wouldn't you agree that you wouldn't have had railroads if we hadn't had river. And then if you hadn't had railroads, then we you know, became a capital and moved on. But there's a lot on a daily basis to keep right the Holly Street Fire Hall. I'm super proud that we saved that after the tornado. And fixing the courthouse, the Second Avenue, not only with Phil Ponder's great help, but we have to re we have to take the past and reimagine it. It can't, it's not something that has to be activated. And with our new Second Avenue plan, and I'm so grateful, Cyril, to all the people and the leadership that everybody is doing, it's going to be Second Avenue, it's going to be First Avenue, it's going to be a new riverfront, and it's going to be just an incredibly exciting and vibrant moment. And in the end, the bombing is an opportunity for us to recreate and preserve and make active and useful that we can all come and visit um, Nashville. That's going to be expensive, and I'm grateful to the Music City Center um, to really provide some of the base funding for the Second Avenue and then the First Avenue reimagining and then the, the riverfront. It's already they're committed to $20 million uh, for that. I think that's going to go ahead despite any of the state legislative initiatives. And imagine a Nashville where in the First Avenue you begin to have cafes facing the river on First Avenue and the park, and hopefully in time we're going to have steamboat river boats coming back to Nashville and taking families for rides up and down the river. You're going to blink your eyes and think that it's maybe 1880. Um, and I think all that is there in our future, but um, I'm grateful, you know, to each one of you because it's only with your help that you have the public consensus and the will to preserve, to renew, to keep our authentic Nashville 
past fresh enough, and this is how a city has its identity, how it's different and unique. And I'm grateful to Tim and his team. Um, each one of you and your work is so important. It's hard. We're not always going to necessarily agree about everything, but there are rewards and dividends. So if you don't mind my sharing a story, so we invested in Sunnyside. Of course, it was a disgrace where we let that be. So much of my work as mayor has been to recover and to fix up and to get us back to the level of functionality. And here we're investing in Sunnyside and the log house behind it. And what dividends do you get? You get 50 Civil War mini balls embedded in the structure. We had no idea that it was honeycombed by actual Civil War artifacts. Enough that you can have the police forensics come and look at the angle that they came in and where the guns had to have been fired, and you can kind of recreate that day in December 1864 with the Battle of Nashville. And isn't it kind of cool that it's the remodeling of the historical commission's dwelling that you find historical artifacts? Sounds like it was located in the right place all along. Um, but. That's the kind of dividend that we can't always expect when we treasure our past, but it's nice to know that right out in front we can say, we're living with the past right here every day. Look, we have a structure in the back that's honeycombed with Civil War ammunition. Who knew? And um, let's just, again, value that and learn from it. It's not like our past was doing anything more than leading us to always understand what a more perfect union looks like. And, but ignoring our past means we're never gonna learn enough to be better in the future. So confront it and be honest about it and live forward and treasure these great past generations, all the generations that built Fort Megley and that happened there and ever since, that's the, the call from history that I think will make us a better society. But again, commissioners, thank you. It's a lot of meetings, very hard. I'm here to say I'm super grateful. And on to the awards. Thank you, Dan. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'm Caitlin Jones, and it has been my pleasure to serve as a judge for this year's Preservation Awards, along with Victoria Hensley and Justin Heskew, who is unable to join us today. Um, it was, I think they invited me back. I served as a Historic Zoning Commissioner, uh, so thank you, Mayor, for the shout out, because it is hard, um, from 2017 to 2022, and I think they invited me back because they knew how much I missed being behind a mic and judging people. So uh, here we go. <laughs> Y'all are in for it now. Um, but uh, sorry, Scarlett, back on uh, paragraph two. Uh, the theme for Preservation Month 2023 is people saving places. In recent years, the theme has focused on the places that matter and the stories that they tell about our past. However, preservation simply doesn't happen without people. Historic place savers pour their time, energy, and resources into protecting places they care about, often without any recognition. So this evening, while we highlight great preservation projects, we also want to shine a spotlight on those who are doing the important work of saving places and building our communities through preservation. Whether they were designing a new house for a vacant lot, rebuilding their beloved tornado damaged home, converting offices to apartments, carefully rehabbing warehouse windows, or just making their house into a home, many passionate preservationists have persevered despite unexpected challenges. So we'd like to say thank you to each property owner, developer, contractor, designer, architect, engineer, and others who have worked on all these nominated projects. You made this happen, and it's your dedication that we celebrate tonight. And now we can't wait to tell you about these terrific projects. As we read the honorable mentions and winning projects names, will everyone associated with that project please stand 
and come uh, to the stage at the center steps here. Uh, and I think probably get a photo taken. Um, and I will describe each project as you're coming forward. Uh, so we're gonna begin with the residential category. As expected, this category was the most popular. And what we didn't expect was the number of really incredible projects that we had to consider. Um, you made our job really tough, and I say that, Victoria and I were talking about it just as we entered today, how hard this was, um, because there are just a lot of great, which is a good problem to have, because that just means there's so much great work going on in our city. So here are the nominations. Okay, and the first one, an honorable mention goes to, drum roll, 1015 Villa Place. Built, yeah. Built in 1908, this house in the Edge Hill neighborhood has been, had been lovingly maintained by the previous owners. However, the interior layout posed some challenges. The stair to the attic was very steep and unsafe, which hindered the conversion of the attic into living space. Determined to maintain the home's original footprint, the team of Allard Ward Architects and David Haverkamp and Ben Nance creatively rearranged the first floor to accommodate a larger staircase while maximizing use of the interior space and modernizing the flow. The original windows, stained millwork, and pocket doors were restored matching the exquisite character-defining features on the exterior. We admired the team's creative approach to working with the historic fabric instead of against it. Great work. Another honorable mention goes to 1500 Davis, Dallas Avenue. This home in Belmont Hillsboro features a distinctive gambrel roof that is characteristic of the Dutch colonial revival style. Purchased as is in 2019, the house was in disrepair with water damage and decay. Designed by Allard Ward Architects, you're gonna hear that name a lot, um, and executed by Dream Inc., this complete renovation included an addition plus accessory structure. We were impressed by the team's dedication to continuing the gambrel roof into the addition, into the new addition and garage. The intersecting gambrels match the form and pitch of the original home and the multiple roof and siding materials meet seamlessly. The result looks effortless, but we know it was not without its challenges. Impressive work. An honorable mention goes to 1805 Lakehurst Drive. Built in 1936, this concrete block house in the Little Hollywood neighborhood sat vacant for many years before Dave Wilson purchased the home in 2020. The property presented multiple challenges, including water damage, non-compliant alterations, small interior spaces, and a limiting, limiting site plan. Undaunted, the team, which included designer Hannah Masterson, craftsman Sam Knight, builder Don Alford, and architect Matthew Schutz, masterfully addressed these issues and carefully designed side additions, a newly reconstructed rear dormer, preventive measures to address water, and a reconfigured interior and a new accessory structure. We admire the team's dedication to improving the home's functionality, efficiency, and safety not to mention its great uh, curb appeal. Excellent work. An honorable mention goes to 2509 Belmont Boulevard. Longtime homeowner Brad Poe has lovingly and carefully renovated his home over the years, all within the home's original footprint. In 2020, he enlisted Allard Ward Architects to design a combined garage and detached accessory dwelling unit benefiting the historic Foursquare. The masterful design executed by Sabia Construction along with landscape and pool by SiteWorks takes cues from the historic home's striking Spanish tile roof, cut limestone veneer, and deep overhanging eaves 
yet it feels distinctly contemporary. The impressive new structure fits the context of the wide lot along the stately boulevard. A new limestone retaining wall brings additional grandeur to the home's Belmont entrance. This is a great example of how to add living and guest space to a property while leaving the original home intact. Beautiful work. And I think they said we were all invited to a pool party later this summer. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> An honorable mention goes to 4700 Hazelwood Circle. This 1955 ranch is located in Oak Hill on a small street off Franklin Road, where ranches are being replaced with much larger homes. After owning the home for several years, Will McLemore and Ginny Wolf were at a crossroads, renovate or replace. Working with Andy Grogan of Manuel Zeitlin Architects, they resolved to preserve the house. The project modernized the home's functionality and opened the interior to capture more space without increasing the footprint. The project also addressed significant challenges like water issues and rotten floor framing. Team members included EMC Structural Engineers, McClure Company, and Firma. We liked the new carport and connection, and we were just all around thrilled to see this house preserved along a street with a lot of changes happening. Great work to the team. And now Victoria Hensley will continue with the awards. All right, thank you, Caitlin. Uh, we will continue on with the residential awards. A preservation award goes to 845 Glen Avenue. <laughs> Located in Waverly Place, this house was built as a single family home around 1904, converted into a duplex around 1995, and returned to a single family home in 2007. In 2020, Lee and Leanne Moneta Kohler enlisted Caitlin Smouse of 912 Architects to guide the removal of non-contributing features and add minimal square footage to the home. This involved research to determine the original layout, reworking, reworking a non-historic addition to better complement the home, restoring the original front door and other openings, and matching windows, flooring, and trim in the new spaces. The project also addressed water and foundation issues, and it's a great example of how to balance historic character with modern amenities. The addition is modest and respectful of the historic home, as well as the large old trees present on the site. We admired the attention to detail and the considerate choices made with this project. Team members included Ken Rojaninsky, Carly Gromit, and Mitchell Construction. Great work. A preservation award goes to 949 Russell Street. Sitting at the eastern edge of historic Edgefield, this is one of the first historic homes you see when you enter the neighborhood here. It was severely damaged by the March 2020 tornado and then set vacant for 18 months, subject to ongoing water damage. By the time Andy and Bethany Arbuckle purchased the home in August of 2021, it was uninhabitable. While a series of owners sought demolition, the Arbuckle saw the home's potential despite the extensive rebuilding project. They managed to save 70% of the exterior siding and salvage the original double front doors and large front bay window. Destroyed windows were replaced with special order wooden windows to match the originals. The entire interior of the house was reframed and brought up to code standards and the stone foundation was repaired. We were impressed by the amount of historic fabric the team was able to save and the team's decision to limit the project to the original home's footprint. 
We also want to acknowledge the many neighbors who supported saving this house as it is a big win for the neighborhood. Amazing job. The preservation award goes to 1915 Holly Street. <laughs> Located in Lachlan Springs, this 1935 Tudor was damaged in the March 2020 tornado. In fact, on this side of the 1900 block, it is one of only three original houses still standing. The project included rebuilding the damaged archways, chimney, roof, windows, and stucco, as well as the construction of a new rear addition to replace the damaged rear porch. The Van Dusen family worked with their contractor, Bootstrap, to return the home to its original appearance. Determined to keep the home's characteristic dark brick unpainted, the team saved every fallen brick that could be reused during cleanup and went above and beyond to source similar brick from another historic home project to complete the repairs and brick the new addition. This extra effort separates this home from its new neighbors and helps maintain the historic integrity of the street. Well done. A preservation award goes to 3713 Princeton Avenue. <laughs> Located in Richland West End, this project improved the home's functions while repairing and restoring many of its historic details. The team of 912 architects and artisan build construct paid close attention to the exterior by rebuilding, repairing, or replacing wood elements like corbels and brackets, cedar shake shingles, and brick mold, repointing the wire cut brick masonry with matching black mortar, and improving the concrete steps and driveway. The new rear addition is modest and maintains the home's long and low profile. We admired the deliberate choices made to honor the home's history, including the use of salvaged 1930 wire cut brick for repairs. The dark brick, the bright limestone, and the craftsman details really pop. Nice work. And our last preservation award in the residential category goes to the YWCA at 209 213th 7th Avenue North. <laughs> Designed by Shattuck and Hussey of Chicago and completed in 1911, the former Young Women's Christian Association building is noteworthy for its Georgian style and the WYCA's contributions to the community. In 1982, the building was converted to offices with a new office wing and emergency exit stair tower. 40 years later, this recent renovation converted the former offices into 55 apartment units. This was a complex process for the team that included GBX Group, two capital partners, Niles Bolton Associates, and Gay Construction, as they had to address each unit individually to maintain the integrity of the interior. The project retained the original plaster ceiling, wall surfaces, and recessed fireplace opening present in the original first floor lobby and elevator lobby spaces, as well as the original staircase connecting the first and fifth floor. This building and its history are ob often overlooked, so we are glad to see it revitalized yet again. Very impressive. <laughs> and now we will move to the infill category with our nominees here. A preservation award goes to 
117 Bowling Avenue. This new home replaced a non-contributing house in Richland West End. The design and development team, including Chris Goldbeck of P. Shea Design and Craftsman Residential, looked to the historic homes in the neighborhood for inspiration, settling on a modern version of the bungalow. Designing infill for a corner lot is always challenging because so much of the new structure is visible. We thought the team, which also included contractor Jerry Owens and landscape design by Studio 360, met the challenge brilliantly. The design is a refreshing new interpretation of the bungalow that truly feels like it belongs at this highly visible corner. We liked the fenestration along the Meadowbrook elevation as much as we liked the Bowling Avenue facade. Great work. And the preservation award goes to 602 Taylor Street. This modern two-story office building is in historic Germantown on the site of the former Tennessee Manufacturing Company. The new infill structure is an important part of Taylor Place, the mixed-use redevelopment of a 14-acre portion of the plant campus. The office building was strategically designed to transition from the single-story buildings along the south to the larger scale historic warehouse and multi-story residential buildings that occupy the site's core. A key part of the design is the exterior stair, which runs alongside the building and encourages pedestrian access throughout the site. We liked how the design is suggestive of peeling back the building's layers. The project successfully accomplished its goal of engaging with the public from all sides and serving as a gateway into Taylor Place. The team included Smith G Studios, Meta Real Estate Partners, HDLA, Genesis Engineering Group, Catalyst Design Group, and RC Matthews Contractor. Terrific job. And now for the commercial category. A preservation award goes to Worthen Warehouse 601 Taylor Place. <laughs> Built in 1951 for the Worthen Bag Company, this dramatic two-story structure measures 98 feet wide by 336 feet long and contains a remarkable 66,000 square feet. The first floor is a reinforced concrete structure, eight column bays by 23, while the upper floor is a steel frame structure supporting a clear span bowed truss roof forming a single columnless interior. The warehouse is a significant part of the Taylor Place redevelopment of the manufacturing campus and the recent rehabilitation is quite remarkable. While a lot of the work a lot of work went into this project, the transformation of the windows is perhaps the most striking result. Artisan metal workers rehabilitated each curtain wall window, renovating the steel casements and meticulously retrofitting the frames with double pane glass for modern day efficiency. Other tasks included the preservation of the original steel bow truss structure and the tongue and groove wood roof decking. Can a warehouse be beautiful? The Words and Warehouse Project answers that question with a resounding yes. Amazing work. And once again, let's give a round of applause to all of our award winners. And thank you. Thank you to everyone who nominated a project this year. You are the people saving places and we applaud you all. Now I would like to introduce Commissioner Clay Bailey who will continue with the honor awards.
Hi, good evening. Um, Gary Burke and I are the same age. We both grew up here in Nashville, yet it took until about 10 years ago for the two of us to meet. What brought us together? A common concern for the fate of Fort Negley and a common passion for preserving our city's past so that we might help create a more perfect union. We all know Gary Burke for his advocacy for the preservation of Fort Negley, the surrounding community, and the stories of descendants of those who built and served there, built the fort and served there. For Gary, this work is deeply personal. As a child, he would visit the park surrounding the fort um, and picnic uh, there with his family. Years later, he um, would don the uniform of the USCT as a member of the 13th USCT, participating in encampments and reenacting the life of a soldier stationed at the fort. Only more recently did Gary Burke learn that he was a descendant of one of those soldiers. His great-great-grandfather, Peter Bailey, was a private in Company K of the 17th Regiment of the USCT and served at Fort Negley in 1864 and 65. Gary has embraced the effort to give voice to those who labored at Fort Negley, not just his great-great-grandfather, but countless others. As a participant and promoter for the uh, Fort Negley Descendants Project, a board member of the Friends of Fort Negley, and uh, a Fort Negley tour narrator for Nashville Sites. In addition, he serves on the board of the Preservation Society of Nashville. Yet these accolades and um, participations do not adequately define Gary. And in, in reflecting on who Gary is, um, I've come up with a term. He is a multimedia advocate through story as a storyteller and historical actor donning the uniform. And he is a singer and he is a poet. So in his own very original way, Gary Burke um, is a powerful preservationist. Uh, in recent years, he has been involved in the erection of two different markers. The first historical marker dedicated to African-American soldiers, which is a Metro marker, uh, for those uh, African-American soldiers who fought at Granberry's Lunette in the Battle of Nashville. And he was also involved in a Civil War Trails sign that went up uh, more recently at STEM Prep Academy. Burke was featured in the Nashville scene recently on a, in a cover story. Uh, he, appear, he has appeared on uh, or has um, been on uh, WPLN radio and appeared on Channel 5's Open Line News Show. Almost invariably dressed in the uniform, he has spoken to groups at various universities, um, and he is ever-present at events uh, at places like National City Cemetery, the African Street Festival, Juneteenth at Fort Negley, and he has served on various panels, been in videos, discussion groups about Fort Negley, and such. Uh, he has also given tours for such groups as the Tennessee Civil War Preservation Association, has appeared in documentaries as an actor. He, um, he will probably again soon do something he has done for years, which is sing the national anthem while in uniform at the Memorial Day Dash. Um, and he also uh, commonly delivers the Memorial Day benediction prayer at Stones River National Battlefield. Gary has been a tireless advocate for Fort Negley and he embodies a connection to that fort that is both inspirational and relatable. Like Fletch Coke, he seems to be everywhere uh, and has been doing that for so many years. Everything preservation related, um, at everything preservation related, he seems to pop up, more typically in uniform. It is for these reasons that we present to Gary Burke 
the Fletch Coke Award. Hold back the tears. Thank you so much. So Mayor Cooper, my good friend, my pal in preservation, as I would call him, and many others of you out there this evening, I am so grateful. So grateful. First and foremost, I would like to thank Almighty God for directing my path and the passion to share local history. The Metro Historical Commission and Director Tim Walker of course, Ms. Fletch Coke, who I'm receiving the award after her, Lynn Maddox, Preservation Society of Nashville, the Friends of Fort Negley, and his former director, Krista Castillo, and interim director, Tracy Harris, Jeff Sellers of the Tennessee State Museum, Dr. Pethel of Belmont University, Dr. Linda Wynn, one of my mentors, retired from Fisk, and Dr. McKee, who's out here, one of my mentors as well. Just a few years ago, I stood on this very stage as a member of the Friends of Fort Negley for previous preservation award, and I never thought I would be recognized for this prestigious award this evening. The Fletch Coke Award was created in 2016, and today I'm the seventh recipient of that award. Thank you, Fletch Coke, as you are an example to follow as a pioneer in preservation, a trailblazer, and encouraging me along the way. Thank you so much. I realize I'm receiving this award mostly for my work at Fort Negley. I often describe her as my bride, who I love, cherish, write poems about, and protect from harm and from developers along with many others. I want to acknowledge my late parents, Wallace and Katie Burke, who taught me about community service at a young age. Excuse me. My mother was the first African-American PTA president of Metro Public Schools, and my father was a chaplain at the old Tennessee State Prison where he volunteered for over 25 years. A very special thank you to my pals in preservation who came out to support me today. I love you and appreciate you. Congratulations to the other recipients of this award. Thank you so much. I'm Carol Busey, and it's my great honor to serve as the Davidson County Historian. Thank you all for coming tonight. I am presenting the Achievement Award, and I'm honored that I'm presenting it to one of the nicest people in all of Middle Tennessee. I have known Phil Ponder for a long time, and I have never heard him raise his voice. He always smiles when he sees anybody, and I am really honored to give him this award. Now, uh, Councilman, former Councilman Ponder grew up in Florida. He attended and graduated from the University of Florida and then joined the United States Navy. Well, when his tenure with the Navy was over, he applied for a job at Genesco and got a management position at Genesco and came to Middle Tennessee, to Davidson County, to Nashville in 1959, where he worked in a variety of management positions and began doing community service activities in the communities of Hermitage, Donaldson and even Old Hickory, the eastern side of town. And that side of town, like others, has seen a tremendous amount of, of change going on there, lots of growth and uh, lots of, of tra people traveling in and out of that area. 
So he got involved with the community there very quickly. He ran and won a position on the Metro Council and served two terms on the Metro Council from 1995 to 2003. He, in the middle of all of this, while he's working at Genesco and doing other things as well, he, serves on a, he served on a lot of Metro commissions. And Metro does have a lot of commissions, don't we? <laughs> we have a lot. But it's, it's the thing about all these commissions is it's citizens participating in government. And I think that's one of the things that's truly unique about Metro government and the need to preserve Metro government. So nonetheless, he served on the Historic Zoning Board, the Metro Planning Commission, the Board of Parks and Recreation. He, then when he retired, he took up a hobby. Actually, he took this up a little bit earlier, but it became a profession when he retired. He started doing art. And one thing led to another. Soon he was doing unique pen and ink sketches of historic buildings, starting at the Hermitage and other parts of the community here. And, and that really blossomed into a second career for him. And we are so lucky to have a visual historian with the artist Phil Ponder in our midst here in Nashville. He has done a tremendous job. His, his drawings are truly unique. It's with mathematic precision in detail that he does these pen and ink sketches and then uses watercolor to make them enhanced. They are beauties and I cannot wait until the newest piece is unveiled on Second Avenue. It's going to be positively uh, amazing to see that. He has left Nashville as well as many other places with a record of what was and what is today. And so it's my great honor to present the Achievement Award to <laughs> Phil Ponder. Thank you, Carol. At my age, I get to take the steps. <laughs> Good afternoon, history lovers. It is so great to be here. Oh, I tell you what, I am so honored. And first of all, thanks to the commission, to Tim, to Lynn, the commissioners, all the staff. You're fabulous. Thank you so much. You know, I used to come to these events, particularly when I worked uh, in the congressional office here with, with uh, Kathy uh, Bugs. Uh, we, I used to come, but uh, it never dreamed that I would be standing up here to receive a, a recognition. So thank you so much. And there's so many uh, people here today that I know. It's just been great. Uh, first, I want to introduce my family, uh, our three daughters, Terry, Deb, and Stephanie on the front row down here. Uh, my wife, uh, Dot, was, was not feeling up to coming today. And we have a son that lives in Georgia. And you know what? They have been an integral part of... Uh, my career as an artist and a historian. And by the way, this is what's important about today, I think. Uh, through the years, a lot of people came up to me and didn't identify me as an artist. They identified me as a historian. This is the proof that they were right. <laughs> so I really appreciate uh, for, for so many different reasons. Um, and then I want to acknowledge, particularly talking about family, I have one huge family out our way, and it's called the Donaldson Hermit Exchange Club. So all members of that club, please stand up. Because right. very well represented. Thank you. And, and there's, there's so many people in here that I've actually served on a board or a commission with. So everybody that has served on a board or commission with me, please stand up, and it's going to be a lot of people, I know. Ann, Bill, everybody. Eileen Behan, of course, was in the council. I want to recognize my council lady, Erin Evans, back here in the back. Erin. And any other councilmen, uh, our past and present councilmen that are here, if you would stand up, uh, we want to recognize everybody. Thank you, thank you. Good. 
All right, now, just in case I've left anybody out, I want everybody to raise their hands because you're all friends of our family. Thank you. Well, who would have dreamed or believed that a guy that grew up in a small Florida town raising chickens for an FFA project would wind up here on this stage? I mean, it's been uh, quite a, a run uh, through the years, and there were a lot of people that helped me. Uh, like I mentioned, the family has been great. Uh, people like uh, Matt Fisher at the Picture This Gallery and, and Dan Bradford, uh, uh, just a lot of different people going on and on and on. Even Charles Wallace, who's somebody I didn't even know, he's the one that talked me in to uh, uh, starting uh, Prince. I never uh, knew him until I met him. He uh, was at a, a, a shop over in Madison, and uh, he, he said, you just got to have Prince made. You're not, not going to just sell that Market Street. That was the first thing I did, Market. You, you can have Prince. So I listened to him after about six phone calls, and we did it, and so that's how it all started. So here we go. A second career was launched. And uh, uh, it, it's history from there. Uh, I've done somewhere around 700 images. Uh, 461 of them are represented in the book that they showed up on the screen a little while ago. And um, it, more coming. Uh, fortunately, uh, I'm booked up for the rest of this year, most of next year. Um, and, you know, it's, it's through the years I have accumulated quite a, a uh, inventory of photographs of historic buildings here in uh, Metro. And I talked to um, Ken Thief, who is the, um, is Ken here? Did he show up? Anyway, uh, he is the archivist for the county. And I advised him a few days ago, and in fact, I talked to uh, Donna nicely about this sometime back, that all of my photographs are going to go to the archives for Metro. And this is the first installment. There are 122 pictures of Union Station in this envelope. So this will go to Ken, and he's going to come out to my house next week, uh, and we're going to go through all my uh, files, and he's going to uh, put those uh, uh, available for anybody in the future that wants to look and see what a particular subject looked like uh, in photographs. Um, and this will be, they can use it for research, they can do their own uh, artwork from it, uh, whatever. So I'm really looking forward to uh, all those Phil Ponder uh, artists that are going to take over the world and, and use this information. One thing that's interesting about these pictures from Union Station, uh, historically speaking, there are pictures that were made when it was being renovated and pictures afterwards. Uh, actually, the first one was from 1975 and the latest one was a few years ago. Uh, the, after the res, uh, restoration, they took the six stained glass windows in the front and they put them back in the wrong place. And I can prove it, because <laughs> right here, right here. It, it's in here. You, there's pictures before and after. So um, th there's just a lot of little things like that. There's a lot of trivia, wonderful trivia about architecture in Nashville and preservation. And again, thank you so much for this honor. I am so, so honored that, that you uh, have uh, uh, done this to me today. And I, I, forever, I am thankful. Mayor, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Here you are. And we have to hear a comment again. Cheryl, do you have a picture? Come here. Thank you. Bear with us just a moment. We're going to have a virtual presentation here.
Hi, I'm Don Fusick with the Metro Historical Commission. And uh, the commission has awarded the Commissioner's Award to RCA Studio A, a legendary facility here in Nashville. It was opened in 1965, and it was opened because RCA had done quite well in Nashville recording people like Elvis Presley and Eddie Arnold and Jim Reeves and Dolly Parton and Waylon Jennings and Jim Ed Brown and Hank Snow, a whole who's who of uh, big hit uh, country artists as well as pop artists such as uh, Rosemary Clooney and uh, Perry Como. Um, the building is actually two buildings. This where I'm sitting is uh, where offices are that way. That way is the studio and the studio was built for RCA to have a facility in Nashville that was as good as the studios in Rome and Los Angeles and all around the world. At this time, we had a musical trend called the Nashville Sound, and that replaced steel guitars with pianos, uh, violins with fiddles, and we needed, or RCA needed, a big room for an entire orchestra, and that's where RCA Studio A came, uh, came into play. Uh, they already had RCA Studio B, but that was a smaller studio. Um, the building was owned by Chet Atkins, uh, right behind me, uh, along with two partners, Owen Bradley and Harold Bradley. And Chet uh, had arranged for RCA to lease the building for him. Um, and this was a landmark, or is a landmark, on uh, Music Row for years and years. Uh, it almost got bulldozed uh, down in uh, a few years back. And uh, Ben Folds led a group uh, that had uh, Sharon Corbett, Trey Bruce, Garth Shaw. Uh, there was a group that rallied uh, Nashville to save this building. Uh, and it was saved. The developer was all ready to uh, tear it down and turn it into uh, mixed-use property. Uh, but this has a, a great historical significance because not only is it a studio for the Nashville Sound, which dominated the sounds of Nashville from uh, oh, the late 50s into the early 70s. Uh, but it's also where uh, Chet Atkins had his office, where a lot of acts were recorded and uh, uh, became a gathering place for RCA records that went out all over the world. RCA Studio A is not only a great historic studio, it is a current working studio. Dave Cobb, one of the uh, top producers in uh, Nashville as well as country music, produces Chris Stapleton, uh, we've had Casey Musgraves, we've had a whole who's who uh, come in to, uh, uh, to record here. So uh, this is a part of the living past as well as the living present. Uh, and that's the uh, timelessness of great studios. Uh, they go on and on. So uh, the Commissioner's Award uh, is, uh, is uh, well represented with RCA Studio A. Thank you, thank you so much to the Metro Historic Commission. Um, I learned something about accepting awards here in Nashville. Is uh, the thing I learned uh, today was never follow Gary Burke or Phil Ponder at accepting an award. So I'll try to do better next time if I if I get this opportunity again. Um, but I I tell you what um, I saw sitting over there is. So a different perspective than I normally see in this world. There's a lot of negative news out there. Have you all noticed that? 
the time we turn this thing on, the you know negative cells and positive doesn't sell apparently. Um, we hear a lot of talk about Nashville's losing this, Nashville's losing this. We certainly are losing some, some things. What I saw today was very inspiring that uh, there's a lot of good going on that doesn't get reported. And there are a lot of um, wonderful grassroots efforts going. Every, every house that I saw here, I, um, so many of those are little houses like the one I started with and, and the love put into those and just the grassroots preservation efforts, which I think is at the absolute heart and soul of the preservation movement. It starts with, it's, it's not really organizations that save things, it's people, as somebody said earlier. So um, I just like, it, would it be okay if we like did a group hug and uh, uh, <laughs> by, by applause for all the good news here and all of the people together? <laughs> Maybe a virtual group hug, is that all right? It's really good. Really, really good news. I'm very inspired. Um, did want to say a couple things about the folks that are here with me. Um, Don did a beautiful job kind of framing uh, uh, the story in a short period of time. He's done so much great work preserving the story. Um, uh, it, for those of you who were here in 2014 when it was going on, uh, there was a major battle going on of PR. There was actually a PR firm, a prominent PR firm, that was hired to propagate the idea that the building was beyond repair, that it had mold and that there was, and it was structurally unsound. That was 100% untrue. And people paid people, paid professionals who propagated that and they pretty much pulled it off. Most people thought that it was about to fall down and it was full of mold. And I just, again, among this group, we have to stick together. When people say that, it's not necessarily true, okay? So um, some of the people that are hit, here with me uh, today were part of solving that problem. It was a big problem because there was a big story that was not true, that was made up. Um, piece by piece, uh, that was disassembled. So there was, there was a lot of people involved that had to team up to take to fix this big problem. I mean, this is Nashville, Tennessee, music city of the world, home of the Ryman, and home of what some historians say is the most important recording site in the world. How could it be possible that Nashville would lose that? Okay, so some of the people behind me are the folks that said, not no, hell no, they literally they will have to come and hit me with the bulldozers, okay? So first off, there was a couple of ways. I want you to um, say hi to Sharon Corbett House right here, okay? She was, she worked with Ben Folds and, uh, and Mike Kopp, and that was the first wave of pulling the fire alarm, getting the advocacy out there, telling the, what the truth was, gathering the angry mob, quite frankly, of people that were not going to accept this. And at that point, they beat them up so bad that, you know, uh, Ben needed some re relief, so he it was almost like tag team wrestling. And he came out and tagged, and the next guy with the next wave that a lot of people don't realize is another guy that's standing up here, uh, hit songwriter Trey Bruce, right here. <laughs> Major. Major MVP in Studio A story. He's the guy that called me while Cyril and I were working on Saving the Franklin Theater. He called me and said, hey, we have a little preservation problem up here. And I was like, no, 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 no. I'm immersed in all the preservation I can deal with. And he said, oh, just come have a cup of coffee with me and give me some advice. So we, we see how that ended up. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm glad it did turn out that way. But, but Trey... Uh, I think is uh, probably the, the biggest unsung hero in my opinion. He, he actually started the Save Studio A uh, petition and really turned the heat up. And we ended up on the front page of the New York Times. And we had, yeah, he was served cease and desist papers. Uh, 
Justin Timberlake weighs in. Paul McCartney weighs in. This was not just a local preservation thing. It went global. And it wouldn't have happened if it hadn't been for those two folks right there hanging on. So, uh, and then it, anyway. And then, uh, as that happened, the value of the property, the value of the, uh, of the, its cultural importance was raised to a fever pitch to where I think a lot more people realized what we were losing. Um, um, I had a few beers one day and decided I would buy it. <laughs> and I came home. No, I actually didn't have the beers, but I, I raised my hand at the last minute. It's kind of like an auction, like scratching your head. And they said, sold! But um, I, uh, I went home, to, I started the day, and then about 4 o'clock I called my wife and said we bought a studio. So that was, that was pretty exciting. Uh, and then we had to figure it out. It was the ultimate leap in the, peer, in, the, in the net will appear. I made two phone calls. One to a guy named Chuck Elkin, who's right here. So, okay. And I thought, well, if we can get this, it's, this is an investment. This is a real estate investment that will have no financial return. How many takers are there for that? <laughs> he immediately said, yes, I'll do one third. Made one other phone call to Mike Kerb, who is the dean of, of, music, of preservation on Music Row. He's preserved so many things and doesn't get enough credit for that. Made one phone call to him. He said, yes. They put the money in the bank, and we closed on it. Um, so thank you, Chuck. And, and thank you to Mike Kerb. Okay, one more thing. I want to thank uh, all the creators, all the, the musicians, all the people that rallied around it, past, present, future. Um, Dave Cobb stepping in and his leadership. Uh, records, uh, world-known records. The Chris Stapleton Traveler record. The, 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 his, then he followed through to help us, and he had uh, Chris Stapleton from a room at Studio A, and he, he continues to carry that torch. And, and Mike Cobb, and, and, and Dave Cobb, every time he makes a record, all of the artists say recorded at Studio A. The whole idea is never, ever let this place ever get in that spot again. Make it really famous for what it is. And so what collectively everybody and others that aren't here have done um, is protected a unique way of life that only happens really here in Nashville. Musicians still getting in a room, making records. At one time, there were RCA studios all over the world. Every one of them is torn down now. The one in New York is gone. The one in LA is gone. The one in Rome is gone. This is like the last living elephant for that way of life. And so, anyway, I just want to thank everybody who was involved, the community, all of you who advocated for it, and uh, thank you for uh, everything you guys are doing. Let's keep it up. recipients. This was so inspiring. And to Lynn and Mary Cooper, thank you for your address. And Tim Walker, that was just incredibly inspiring. And I just want to honor all the leadership in this room. My name is Kelly Bannon. Um, I am the co-founder of the Preservation Society of Nashville. Yeah, I'm Betsy Phillips. I'm with Historic Nashville, Inc. <laughs> Y'all don't need to <laughs> thank you. But yeah, you have your own following then. I guess so. <laughs> I'm Asia Hi, I'm also with Historic Nashville, Inc. Okay. <laughs> we just want to make sure that you all know that you are heartily welcomed to the reception, which is at uh, 225 Polk Avenue. It's the former Ben West. I actually work in radio. You would think I would know how to step up to the microphone. <laughs> 
Um, it's just down the street at the former Ben West Library, and you can see it right there. We hope that you will join us. Um, and on behalf of HNI, of Historic National Inc., of Preservation Society, and the Metro Historical Commission Foundation, we want to cheers you and celebrate with you there. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. We hope to see you at the reception. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again or for more information on this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.